Dr. Anderson mentioned, um, this is a, a great week for us as we are able to host our uh, students here, your peers, for the Lester E. Pipkin Expository Preaching Week. Um, almost all of our guys at ABC, it has become a requirement uh, these last several years that we build it in that they take the homiletics class. And uh, these three students that we have this week um, have been selected um, generally uh, from the homiletics class, but again, um, really this becomes under the ministry core for the guys, but uh, these guys have been selected to present a sermon here this week. So where it's, it's uh, somewhat of a class um, thought or requirement, it is a great opportunity for them to just simply be able to minister here in chapel and to glorify God with what God has um, allowed them to uh, develop and placed on them as a, a burden and a passion. And um, with our homiletics class, it's generally two semesters, and we have a, a homiletics one and a homiletics two. Both are taught by uh, Dr. Sams, who is, is also joining us live stream here today and this week. But um, this is a, a great opportunity uh, for our students that previously we've had guys graduate in different majors besides pastoral, and they did not take homiletics. So this is a great opportunity to be able to um, enhance both the students' lives and then to help you in the future as you work, even as a layperson, maybe in a church, and be able to preach and do this. So this event is hosted by Mount Calvary Baptist Church in Charleston, Pastor Jesse Wagner. And then the final selection will uh, preach then um, here before school's out um, on a Sunday at Mount Calvary. Um, today we have, you know, Joe Horrocks, who is our first preacher. And he is a pastoral major and a junior, and he is from Richmond, Virginia. So I know you're looking forward to this. We're looking forward to this. So, Joe, would you come preach for us? Please turn with me in your Bibles this morning to Romans chapter 6. Romans chapter 6. I do want to express my thanks for the privilege to share the Word of God with you this morning. And for the staff being here, and I'm thankful for my local pastor being here and his wife, and I'm thankful for that. And uh, students, I would thank you for being here, but you have to be here. So I suppose I should be saying thank you for not paying the $10 fine to avoid hearing me preach. <laughs> but we'll be in Romans chapter 6 this morning. We'll be in verses 1 through 14 and we'll in Romans chapter 6. But just as I begin, I would like to say that as Christians, uh, we must live in the reality of our identity with Christ. We live in a very diverse world today. With, in our world are many nations, and each nation has its own national, cultural identity. Within each, of, within each of those nations, there are many individuals, once again, with their own identity. And your identity and my identity, who you are, is often a multifaceted thing. For example, most of us here are American. I'm a Virginian. Those are both identities. We are students. That's another identity. If you have an occupation, that is also part of your identity. And beyond those, each of you has your own unique personal identity that makes up who you are, composed of your own thoughts of various things, your quirks and your nuances and things like that. But that uh, idea of identity within our society is something that's been emerging lately in the past decade, and, and now we even have things emerging such as the concept of, of gender identity. Because ultimately the question, who am I and what does that mean, it will emerge at one point or another in your life and in everyone else's life. And it dominates a lot of conversation in those who are looking to find their place and purpose in life. In a very real way, people obsess over these thoughts and they become disconnected from reality. And I realize now that I didn't tell you my sermon's title, which is Living in Reality. And it's understandably so that people get so disconnected from reality, caught up in this idea of, who am I? What's my purpose? You know, really, what, what, does, who I, what does who I am mean for me in my daily life? Because who you are has an undeniable effect on what you do, how you act. But the question of who am I and what does that mean is as old as time itself. 
In the Roman church, there was a disconnection from reality in Jewish and Gentile believers. These were ethnically and culturally different people. And they had a disconnect from who they were together in Christ. So Paul writes to them to unite them as one body in Christ who shares one identity in Christ. Paul talked a lot about their shared guilt, their shared redemption, and now he speaks of them of their shared identity and what that means in their daily life. Because who they were affected what they did, how they should live. And they needed a good understanding of the reality of who they were in Christ. So today we are going to discuss three ways that we can live in the reality of our identity in Christ. And the first way that we can live in the reality of our identity in Christ is by embracing our identity in Christ. And we're going to be looking at verses 1 through 5. So please join me in Romans 6, beginning in verse 1. What shall we say then? Shall we continue in sin that grace may abound? God forbid. How shall we that are dead to sin live any longer therein? Know ye not that so many of us as were baptized into Jesus Christ were baptized into his death? Therefore we are buried with him by baptism into death, that like as Christ was raised up from the dead by the glory of the Father, even so we also should walk in newness of life. For if we have been planted together in the likeness of his death, we shall be also in the likeness of his resurrection." Paul presents a hypothetical question here. If grace has abounded more than sin, as chapter 5 verse 20 says, should we then freely sin to generate more grace? And Paul uses this term in the Greek, you know, may it not be, let it never be, God forbid, to express an absolute disdain and rejection of this notion. Paul's not passively brushing it off. He's completely rejecting it. He's not expressing that the idea is a little off the mark or that it's kind of wrong, but that it's absolutely, unequivocally wrong in the strongest way that his language can. And Paul uses this phrase a lot. It's found over 60 times across his epistles. He gives an answer to this hypothetical question in the form of a question. How shall we that are dead to sin live any longer therein? Well, as the reader, then my response is, okay, Paul, In what way am I dead to sin? I don't know about you all, but I still certainly feel the effects of sin in my daily life. So the question then becomes, in what way am I dead to sin? Well, hang on, because Paul, as he often does, he's going to build his answer and advance it in several stages. And he does so here with a question. Know ye not, or don't you understand that as many of us as were baptized into Jesus Christ, were baptized into his death, This baptism, of course, that Paul speaks of here is not that of water baptism, but that of spirit baptism, the joining of the believer into the universal body of Christ upon their salvation. Of course, we find this in 1 Corinthians 12, 13, for by one spirit are we all baptized into one body, whether we be Jews or Gentiles, whether we be bond or free, and have been all made to drink into one spirit. So not only are we baptized into this universal body of Christ, but apparently We are baptized into the very death of Christ itself. When we accept Christ as Savior, we, in a a spiritual sense, experience a real spiritual death, just as Christ experienced a real physical death. We are crucified with Christ. And not only so, but just as Christ was raised to physical life, we are raised to walk in newness of spiritual life. At the end of chapter 5, Paul juxtaposes Adam's sin and Christ's righteousness. Adam's sin was under condemnation. Uh, Christ's righteousness was under justification. Adam's sin was to death. Christ's righteousness was under life. But in the beginning of chapter 6, Paul is illustrating and he's painting a picture of a parallel between the believer and Christ. The believer's spiritual death, Christ's physical death. Christ's physical resurrection, the believer's spiritual resurrection to walk in newness of life. This passage so purposefully highlights the identity that we have with Christ in such detail. And I believe that Paul does this intentionally. And there's such a sense of unity and closeness in this passage that I believe effectively portrays that our position in Christ, listen, that our position in Christ, it's not an addition to who you are. It's not a supplementation to who you are. It's not an alternative to who you are. When you are in Christ, that is your identity. Christ has given you an identity in Him. 
back home at, at my home church, there's a, a gentleman named Ernest Johnson. He's about 83 or 84. And Ernest, uh, in his younger years, was in the Marine Corps. And he served in the Vietnam War. And he won't speak very much about that, but what he speaks a lot of is his time in training and uh, his time as a drill instructor after his time in service and, and the specifics of his training. He speaks very freely of the processes and the intention of the training that he went through. To paraphrase his words, the training is meant to break you down from who you were when you entered that training so that they may rebuild and mold you into a soldier. They give you a new identity that can handle the hardship of service. It has a practical purpose. They don't wish to alter your identity or change it a little bit, but to give you a newly crafted identity for a specific purpose. The fact of the matter is that when they are done with you, you're not intended to be the same in identity or in practice. And such is the case for those of us in Christ. Embracing your identity in Christ means embracing the fact that you are not and will never be the same person that you were before you knew Christ. For many people, their pasts and the choices that they made in their pasts haunt them. And you might have a tendency to think of yourself as your worst decision. And other people might think of you as your worst decision. And you might obsess over the things that you've done and the person that you were. But all that we were before Christ died with Christ. The soldier gets to return to his civilian, to his civilian identity. But we never lose who we are in Christ. That is an irrevocable, immutable identity that Christ has given us. And we must embrace our identity in Christ by leaving behind that old identity and cleaving to our identity in Christ. The second way that we can live in the reality of our identity with Christ is to accept the ramifications of your identity. Accept the ramifications of your identity. Please pick up with me in verse 6. Knowing this, that our old man is crucified with him, that the body of sin might be destroyed, that henceforth we should not serve sin. For he that is dead is freed from sin. Now if we be dead with Christ, we believe that we also shall live with him. Knowing that Christ, being raised from the dead, dieth no more, death hath no more dominion over him. For in that he died, he died unto sin once. But in that he liveth, he liveth unto God. So here Paul is transitioning into the, the whys or the so what's of our uniquely close new identity in Christ with the statement that the old man is crucified with Christ. The old man is, of course, who we were before we were saved. It's the the unregenerate, unrepentant self, the self that is complicit in choosing sin with no desire to seek after righteousness. It's the self that only desires to lead you away from God, and we went along right with it. That's what was crucified with Christ. But Paul is not just simply describing our identity in Christ for the sake of knowledge. It's not just for mere academia, but he's doing so in such detail to advance his flow of thought to the ramifications of our identity in Christ, the so what's of our identity in Christ. The end of verse 6 and verse 7, they take the identity described in verses 1 through 5 and they shed light on its practical purpose. That the body of sin might be destroyed, that henceforth we should not serve or be slaves of sin. For he that is dead is freed from sin. Now, something that fascinates me is that this word here for destroyed in verse 6 is a word in the Greek that means to render inoperative or to annul. I posed the question earlier as a reader, in what way am I dead to sin? Because I certainly feel its effects on me even now. And Paul's argument has now led us to answering that question. We are not dead to sin in the sense that we no longer can sin. That will be the case one day, praise God. 
But that's not what Paul's getting at here. The body of sin being destroyed means that sin's constraining power over us has been destroyed. Listen to this. It is no longer the power of sin that constrains us, but the love of Christ that constrains us. We now wield the power of choice enabled by the Spirit to resist sin. And moving forward, Paul's telling us that, that we, since we have died with Christ, we will one day live with Him. And this has a twofold truth to it. We are spiritually alive with Christ now, Ephesians 2, 5, and we will physically be like Him in resurrection bodies one day, 1 John 3, 2. And moreover, we know that since Christ's death was a one-time occurrence, that death no longer has dominion over Him. He submitted to the rule of death, and so He no longer has to. In that same sense, our spiritual death not only means that death and the power of sin no longer have dominion over us in the present, but it also means that the power of death and the dominion of sin can no longer ever have dominion over us. Uh, A handful of years ago, uh, I I worked at a GNC back home, General Nutrition Center or Corporation, or I don't remember, I started out as an associate when I worked there, and so my responsibilities were mainly, you know, the upkeep of the store and um, selling people new products that may or may not work, selling people memberships that, frankly, they didn't need, uh, things like that. I was a real real scumbag. Um, (laughs) And I was an associate for most of my time there, but there was a period of time where the store needed a a manager. Uh, My manager had quit for some reason or the other, and uh, I was asked to become, for some reason, I was asked to become that manager until they found a suitable replacement. (laughs) Wasn't very long. Um, (laughs) But all of a sudden, my position within the company, my identity within the company, it had gone from associate to manager, so from grunt to slightly bigger grunt. And for the first week or so, I didn't really feel any extra responsibility. I just kind of did what I would normally do as an associate, you know, open the store, close the store, make the bank deposits, uh, stock shelves, sell the aforementioned questionable products, you know, things like that. Um, I knew that my position within the company, that my identity within the company, I knew that it had changed, but I didn't really feel any effect of it for that first week or so, except for getting paid, of course, more. Um, well, as almost all good things do, it, it did not last. Um, and my then district manager, he called me on the phone and he was explaining to me all of the responsibilities that I would have now as a store manager. I had a ton of paperwork to do, uh, especially at the end of the week, and I had to, as the term manager would suggest, manage the store uh, and my staff and the schedule and, you know, ultimately all conflicts came to me. And I felt really over my head at the time. And it was quite a load of responsibility. My point in saying that is that when you experience a change of any kind within your life, any change of identity within your life, whether it's within your family or your friends or it's your job, it doesn't matter. When you experience any kind of change of identity there are ramifications to that change. And my point is that within our identity in Christ, like any other change, that change has ramifications. If we've embraced our identity in Christ, we have to accept the realities that come along with that change in our identity. I've heard many Christians say that they don't feel saved. I've heard many Christians also dismiss the sin in their lives by saying, it's just who I am, it's just too hard, I've always had this problem, it's just, it's just who I am. And you know what, I've excused my own sin in that way, I don't preach down to you. And it's a great way to not feel culpable for your sin, but it's a lie. In Christ, you have been freed from the power of sin. Listen to this. In Christ, you get to say no to your flesh. I grew up as a church person. My entire life, I have heard, you have to say no to sin. You must say no to sin. 
it's imperative that you say no to sin. And that's well and true. You should, and yes, you do have to say no to sin. But what's amazing is that that command of saying no to sin, whether you're saved or whether you're unsaved, that command is still ever-present, and everyone's equally responsible to keep that commandment. But before I was saved, before you were saved, there was no saying no to the flesh. You were complicit in choosing your sin. I was complicit in choosing my sin. There was no choosing Christ. It was only ever choosing myself. What's amazing isn't that I now get to practice the statement, you have to say no to your sin. What's amazing is that I get to say, I can say no to sin. I can say no to sin. This sin that, oh, I just, I'm so frustrated by it and I feel like I just, I can never stop doing it. Yeah, you can. Because Christ has freed you from the power of that sin. In Christ, you get to say honestly and boldly that sin will never have the hold on you that it once did. But frankly, it also means that however much of a pull that sin has on you, that's up to you. And that's up to me. I said earlier that we embrace our identity in Christ by leaving behind our old identity and cleaving to our new identity in Christ. But to accept the ramifications of our identity in Christ, I think, is twofold. It is to live, one, it is to live in light of the gloriously comforting fact that sin is no longer your master. Those chains, those shackles, they have been forever loosed. But to accept the ramifications of your identity in Christ also means living soberly with the fact that your spiritual failure is your own and it is your responsibility. You cannot get by by saying, I've always had this problem, it's just, it's just one of those things. It is not one of those things. You get to say no to your flesh. But not only must we embrace our identity in Christ, not only must we accept the ramifications of our identity in Christ, but finally, the third way that we can live in the reality of our identity in Christ is to wage war against the flesh. Please pick up with me in verse 11. Likewise, reckon ye also yourselves to be dead indeed unto sin, but alive unto God through Jesus Christ our Lord. Let not sin therefore reign in your mortal body, that ye should obey it in the lusts thereof. Neither yield ye your members as instruments of unrighteousness unto sin, but yield yourselves unto God as those that are alive from the dead, and your members as instruments of righteousness unto God. For sin shall not have dominion over you, for ye are not under the law, but under grace. Paul's argument comes to a head here. Um, and he switches his flow of thought from our new internal identity in Christ now to the practice of the, the outward practice of that identity in Christ. But before we dig into the section, let me tell you something that you probably already know because we all take the same classes. Um, in Paul's day, letters were meant to be read publicly in, in, in their entirety. Romans is long. It is a long epistle. So they must have been standing there for like an hour or two. But that being said, think, of me, think with me about Romans up until this point. Paul discusses the universal guilt of the Jews and the Gentiles, how all are guilty before God's law. He discusses how now God has made righteousness apart from the law available to all. He spends chapters explaining justification, this, this declaration of righteousness, this imputation of Christ's righteousness onto the believer. He comes into chapter 6, he says, this is who you are in Christ. This is your identity in Christ. This is what it means to have your identity in Christ. And now he says here, now here, here we're going to practice it now. In verse 11, in the phrase, likewise reckon ye also yourselves, this word here that's translated reckon or reason or however else your Bible translates it, the word means um, to take account of or to calculate. And it's used a lot in a, a mathematical sense. And actually, it's likely where we get the word logic from. So in a sense, Paul is telling the Roman church here, 
If you think back on everything that I just told you, or everything that you've just heard or read, where you were, how God has brought you along, where you are, who you are, what that means, then if you weigh that out in your minds, if you really think about it, then you will, as we should, conclude logically, reasonably, that they must be dead to sin and alive to God, just as we must. Paul personifies sin here as, as a ruling authority, saying that sin should not reign, which in the Greek, it, it, it comes from a word that means to be king. Don't let sin be king in your mortal body. And he gives another illustration in verse 13. Neither yield ye your members as instruments of unrighteousness unto God, but yield yourselves unto God as those that are alive from the dead, and your members as instruments of righteousness unto God. Paul tells the Roman church not to present themselves as instruments or weapons, your Bible might say, of unrighteousness, personifying righteousness as an, uh, personifying unrighteousness as an entity to yield yourself to. In the second half of this verse, this is contrasted to God, to whom Paul says, you should indeed present yourselves to be a weapon of righteousness for God. There's a reference back to our new spiritual life. And it's kind of presented in such a way as to say, those who are spiritually dead use their bodies to serve as weapons or instruments of unrighteousness. But that's not you. You should use your body as an instrument, as a weapon of righteousness for God. It's rational. It makes sense. It's reasonable. Paul is calling the Roman church to a reasoned, calculated, determined commitment to wage war against their flesh. This freedom of choice resting on the fact that they've been freed from the law's bondage in Christ. And such is the case for all of us. One of the most famous rivalries in all of sports is the rivalry between Duke and UNC's basketball teams. Who in here is a fan of UNC? No? No one? I see one hand. I'll pray for you. Um, <laughs> I'm kidding. I don't have a horse in the race. But this rivalry has almost 70 years of history behind it. And, and if any of you know anything about college basketball, this is something people take seriously. Grown adults will fight each other over, over, over basketball teams that don't know that they exist. <laughs> Might have upset somebody with that comment. Um, of course, the, the rivalry between the two schools extends beyond basketball. You know, the, the, the schools are diametrically opposed in, in other ways. Like Duke is a private school. UNC is a public school. Duke is known for engineering and medicine. UNC is known for journalism and, and, um, and research. But the main thing, of course, that everyone knows the rivalry for is about the basketball team. So if you were then to mistakenly reference a Duke Blue Devils basketball player as a UNC Tar Heels player, they'd probably be quite offended because the two are diametrically opposed to one another. In the realm of the sport, they represent different things. I mentioned earlier that this rivalry has about 70 years of history behind it. So let me tell you how it started, and it's a really short story, I promise. In the 1960s, a player named Art Heyman withdrew from his commitment to play at UNC in order to commit to playing for Duke. That's it, that, that's all that happened. <laughs> In, in, in retrospect, it's really funny, but it brings out a good point. Art Heyman was committed to UNC. He had aligned himself with UNC. He had identified himself with UNC. But when he withdrew his commitment and decided to play for Duke, his identity and alignment with UNC, or excuse me, um, yeah, with UNC was no more. It wouldn't then be appropriate for Heyman to show up at UNC's practices or to wear UNC's uniform or to try and score points for UNC in their games against Duke. It would be contrary to his uh, identity and it would be a return to an identity that not only is he opposed to, but one that he chose to forsake. 
And that is exactly the case when we choose to return to our sin. Where can I even begin in this lifelong war against sin? I can't say anything that hasn't been said before. But the war of personal sin is, is not one that you can be an innocent bystander in. There are no non-combatants in this war. Your flesh will always war with your spirit. I think you probably knew that by now. And I'm telling you something you already know. But your flesh will always war with your spirit. It has since the day you got saved. It will till the day that you die. And the same guy who wrote Romans 6 telling you not to do all these things wrote Romans 7 saying he's frustrated that he does these things he doesn't want to do either. I watch myself yield my body as an instrument of unrighteousness more than my pride would have me to admit. In reality, it's kind of a bummer to say it, but in reality I can honestly say that you'll never be done fighting this war as long as you live because it will never surrender. Our victory in this war, of course, comes when this corruptible puts on incorruption, when this mortal puts on immortality. But while you and I will never be done fighting this war of sin in our lives, we do strive to win the battle daily. Because the fact of the matter is that in Christ, we are not promised to be freed from struggle, but we are freed to struggle. And there's a plethora of ways that I could tell you how to fight against your sin, but let me just give you what I think is a universal principle for waging war against your flesh. Never welcome the enemy into your camp. Never befriend him. Never forget that he only ever wants to kill you. And you should never forget that you should only ever want to kill him. Never become comfortable with your sin that it might coexist alongside you. Because Christ has enabled you to do so. Hate your sin and weep over your sin. Be sick of your sin. Because to return to your sin is to, in practice, Forsake the identity that Christ died to give you. And if that sounds harsh, I'm sorry, but it's true. You know, how, how, comfortable, um, how comfortable are you with your sin? When is the last time that you wept over your sin? When is the last time that you stopped and you considered how disgusting how wicked your sin really is. When was the last time that, that you felt so sick of your sin that, that you said, I have to get away from this. I have, to, I have to get rid of this. I have to purge this from me as if I've taken a poison. I wasn't able to go home for, for Easter this year. I had a wonderful Easter here. Um, and I'm not just saying that because my pastor's here. Uh, but I had a wonderful Easter here. But, well, of course, when I was home on spring break, my... My church had uh, our Easter decorations up. And uh, behind my church's podium, behind the choir loft, up in the baptismal, we had a, a large, smooth, polished wooden cross with a, a purple garment draped around it to show Christ's royalty. It was beautiful. But of course, that's, that's not really a good image of what it was like. Christ died a miserable death, a humiliating death, a lonely death, solitary for the first time from the Father and the only time in all of eternity. And you might diminish each specific instance of your sin as, as these are isolated incidents and ultimately they're inconsequential. But let me tell you that each and every time that you decide to be comfortable enough with your sin to let it coexist alongside you, that was the consequence of it. And that's the consequence of my sin. You, you are culpable, and I am culpable for the death of Christ in each and every instance of our sin. And if, and if I'm making you feel bad, I'm sorry. I'm not calling you a bad person. I'm calling sin wicked. And who are we to forsake the identity that Christ has given us? 
and to return to service of sin. If the question asked is, who am I and what does that mean? This is the answer. You are a redeemed sinner saved by grace. You are a child of God who died with Christ, being freed from the power of sin and raised to walk in newness of life. You are God's, bought by the blood of Christ. That is the reality in which we live in with all of its ramifications. And what does that mean? That we must reasonably choose to wage war against our flesh and walk in the newness of life granted to us by Christ. Father, I thank you for the privilege to be here today. I thank you so much for your son, Jesus Christ, who freed me from my sin. And Lord, forgive me for my failure to walk in the newness of life that you've given me. I pray, Lord, that you would confront us with our sin, Lord, that we would be sick over our sin, that we would hate it, and that we would want to purge ourselves of it, Lord, that we might better serve you and that we might better serve your church. And I pray that, Lord, you would just bless all of us throughout the rest of the day as we continue to serve you. In your son's name, amen.